Good afternoon and welcome to ICE Webinars, a cool place for hot topics. We're excited for today's presentation featuring Dr. Stavros, Chief Medical Officer at Sino Medical. ICE Webinars would like to thank today's sponsor, Sino Medical. Sino Medical is a medical imaging company formed to commercialize a new modality in cancer diagnosis called optoacoustic imaging a strong experienced management team and nationally recognized medical advisory board have been assembled to complete the commercialization, secure regulatory approval, and launch the products. The management team has a long history of developing successful commercialized medical devices. For more information, visit their website at sinomedical.com. Couple of reminders for our t attendees today before we get started. ICE Magazine is excited to announce the location for ICE 2023. Save the dates for February 17 through 19, 2023, and join us in Nashville, Tennessee. The Imaging Conference and Expo is the only conference dedicated to imaging directors, radiology administrators, and imaging engineers. ICE offers valuable CE credits from the ASRT and ACI, and it's a unique community of key decision makers and influential imaging professionals. Our call for presenters is open online. We're currently accepting submissions for our education lineup. You can find more information about the conference and how to submit your education ideas at attendice.com. As a reminder, today's webinar is eligible for one ARRT Category A CE credit by the HRA. You can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one hour after the completion of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive the credit, and you'll be able to download your certificate directly from the computer once the survey is submitted. If you have any questions, you can reach our team at webinar at mdpublishing.com. As I mentioned earlier, Dr. Stavros is our presenter today. We will have a presentation and then follow up with a live Q&A. Attendees are welcome to submit your questions for the Q&A at any time during today's webinar. You can use the question feature on your webinar dashboard to do so. Dr. Stavros will discuss how the new PMA-approved hybrid modality uses optoacoustics fused with ultrasound to provide your patients a better experience providing superiority over ultrasound alone. Dr. Stavros, you may begin whenever you're ready. Hello, uh, I'm Tom Stavros, and I'm going to be talking to you today about a new fusion modality um, called optoacoustics. Right now I've got my camera on, but I found that um, the camera being on takes up some bandwidth, and on certain slides it covers images or, or text. So as we proceed, I'm going to turn my camera off. Right. Okay, so my disclosure is that I am the Chief Medical Officer for Sino Medical Instruments, who makes the optoacoustic device we're talking about. But we're going to start now with the rationale for developing optoacoustics. We've learned how to do a targeted uh, diagnostic uh, breast ultrasound exam and how to interpret it so that we achieve a very high sensitivity over 95% and approaching 98% in most cases. The problem with that is that the grayscale morphologic features of benign and malignant masses overlap significantly, and that prevents us from achieving um, a very high specificity uh, at very high sensitivity. So we have a lot of false positives. Um, and so what we need to do is add a functional component to our imaging in order to decrease this overlap of the pure morphologic findings and to improve specificity without adversely affecting sensitivity. Now, the reason that this functional component can work is that we know that breast cancers can't grow beyond 
uh, two millimeters in size without generating uh, angiogenesis. Uh, below two millimeters, they can live by passive diffusion of um, nutrients in and wastes out. But above two millimeters, they need to develop a, their own blood supply in order to continue growing. We also know that breast cancers are generally more metabolically active and deoxygenate blood relative more than uh, benign masses or normal tissues. And so we can show with optoacoustics both angiogenesis and the relatively greater degree of deoxygenation. So what is optoacoustics? It's a fusion imaging technique in which we use combination of laser and ultrasound. We send laser into two different wavelengths uh, and we receive ultrasound out. It's a fusion of laser and ultrasound modalities, but it's also a second type of fusion, a fusion of uh, morphology and function. Now the morphology in optoacoustics comes from both the grayscale ultrasound image, but also the appearance of the tumor neovessels because they're often, malignant neovessels are often quote unquote polymorphic. They vary in size, shape and orientation uh, and in caliber, they often have uh, angular courses. Uh, and the function comes from the relatively greater degree of deoxygenation uh, that uh, happens within cancers. The important thing is that this functional component comes without having to inject a radionuclide or contrast agent because it's using uh, intrinsic hemoglobin as a contrast agent. So what we have is a duplex probe, uh, with, and I'll show you more pictures of it later, but we're sending in wavelengths, uh, two different wavelengths of laser, and it's absorbed primarily in hemoglobin. And when it's absorbed, it causes thermoelastic expansion of the blood vessel in which the hemoglobin lies. And that creates a pressure wave that comes back to the uh, duplex probe that is detected as ultrasound. So the ultrasound probe can't really detect, a, uh, can't distinguish a pressure wave from an ultrasound wave. It interprets this pressure wave back as ultrasound. So it's light in, uh, absorption in hemoglobin, thermoelastic expansion, pressure out, detected as ultrasound. Laser in, ultrasound out. Now we use these two different wavelengths and you don't need to remember the numbers. Just remember that the short wave I've colored red because we code deoxygenated blood as red. And the long wave I've color coded as green because uh, uh, that's absorbed primarily in oxygenated blood. And we've chosen the, these wavelengths to get the maximum distance between oxygenated and deoxygenated where there's the most difference. And also to avoid, avoid the confounding water peak. So our color display shows that red and fuchsia is deoxygenated and green and aqua is oxygenated. Uh, and it was meant to be like a stop light. Um, you know, red means, hey, look at me, I'm dangerous, stop at the intersection, don't run through the intersection. And green means it's okay, we can go. Now, that, obviously that's an oversimplification. We'll talk more about that later. This is the real-time display that we have. We have a real-time grayscale image in the left upper corner. And then we have the short wave, which is mostly deoxygenated blood in the right upper corner and long wave, which is mostly oxygenated in the, in the right lower corner, if things are brighter on the short wave, they will be colored red, deoxygenated. Uh, and so we can see that there's a lot of um, deoxygenated vessels within the internal lattice of this lesion that are being displayed as red. And we can see that there's some purple radiating vessels that are displayed as green. They're brighter and sharper on the long wave. So the way the color is created is the, the long and short wave are compared, a mean is taken, and if it's, uh, if, if the brightness is greater uh, on the short wave side, it's colored red, brighter and sharper on the uh, long wave side, it's colored green. Notice that there's some background uh, signal that can have interfere with the valuation of these peripheral zone vessels. And so uh, the next thing that's created is a total hemoglobin map. Here we don't distinguish oxygenated from deoxygenated. It's colored yellow, and it's a combination of oxygenated and deoxygenated. That gives us a total hemoglobin map then that's used as a map on top of the OA relative to create the OA combined. And generally, OA and, uh, total and OA combined, we use about 90% of the time to make the interpretation, but there are instances in which the OA relative is better. Now, one thing we've learned is that the angiogenesis and deoxygenation around invasive malignant masses is not evenly distributed. In fact, much of it is outside of what Virads considers to be the mass, at least Virads edition five the hypocoaccentronitis. And if you just get two orthogonal still images through the widest part of the lesion, which is what we typically do on ultrasound uh, for documentation purposes, uh, there's a relative paucity of vascularity in the internal part of the mass in some types of cancers. And this vessel on the front might be interpreted as a benign vessel because it's draping over the surface. 
But if we store short axis video sweep, in other words, a sweep across the lesion to include some normal tissue on either side of the lesion, that's how we're going to detect this uh, uh, unevenly distributed, non-uniformly distributed neovascularity and angiogenesis. So the video loops are important. We generally get two video loops, uh, one short axis and radial, and one short axis and anti-radial, or one short axis and longitudinal, one short axis and transverse. It's important that we have two orthogonal views. And it's also important that in this video sweep include surrounding tissues, because that is often where most of the angiogenesis lies. Now, this shows why function is important. This is triple negative cancer. We all know that certain types of cancers, like triple negative invasive ductal cancers, uh, mucinous cancers, um, encapsulated papillary carcinomas can look very benign on ultrasound, but we can clearly see that they're polymorphic vessels that vary greatly in size, shape, and orientation internally with intense deoxygenation and much more capsular blood flow than we would normally see. So we've got an example right here of a false negative, triple negative on ultrasound, but true positive on OA. It shows the, the benefit of having a functional component. We divide the cancer into three zones. And so the internal zone corresponds to what Byred's edition five considered the whole mass, the hypocoxentralitis. The boundary zone includes the thick echogenic uh, rim in edition five, or the thin hypercoacapsule that surrounds benign uh, lesions or malignant lesions pushing leading edges. And the peripheral zone is what's outside that and often considered uh, associated findings in, in Byred's. Now, edition six, is going to include a thick echogenic rind. So they've changed the word rim to rind. So they're restoring at least part of the uh, boundary zone. Notice in this case, um, we've got tremendous deoxygenation of polymorphism internally and in the boundary zone, which is where most of the angiogenesis is. And then we have peripheral radiating vessels in, in the peripheral zone as well. So all three zones are positive in this case. Now, we have a functional and morphologic component in MRI. So we've got morphology and then we've got kinetics. And just like MRI in OA, when the morphology and function agree, we have no problem. So on the left, we have intense deoxygenation in the internal zone. These are polymorphic vessels. So the polymorphism is morphologic. The red is uh, functional. Uh, the function and morphology agree. That's very suspicious. But every living tissue has to have um, arteries and veins. Uh, so benign lesions, normal tissues, malignant lesions have to have a combination of red and green vessels. In general, the green vessels are arteries and the red vessels are either veins or neovessels. And so in this case on the right, we have very reassuring morphology. It's an oval-shaped, flat, circumscribed lesion with a thin hypercoat capsule. And the morphology of the vessel is normal. It's just draped over the surface, as is typical in benign fibroadenomas. But the, the, the uh, function is suspicious. It's red. So in this case, we have discordancy of function and morphology. And just like in MR, when there's discordancy between morphology and function, in a way, we weigh more heavily uh, the morphologic findings. So this is going to be considered a benign feature, even though it's red. Remember that all living tissues have to have a combination of veins and arteries. And, and so they're going to, you should have some red and green vessels and everything. What we're looking for in cancers is disproportionately um, increased red and uh, polymorphism of the vessels. Now, it's important that you realize that um, OA is not a submodality of uh, ultrasound like a Doppler or contrast enhanced ultrasound or elastography. This is truly a hybrid uh, modality that's a fusion of two different modalities, laser light in and ultrasound out. So it's actually more similar to a PET CT or PET MR than it is a Doppler or ultrasound. And this is a six millimeter um, grade two invasive ductal cancer. And I'm showing you the power Doppler on the left and the OA on the right. And this degree of discrepancy between what would be considered a primarily false negative Doppler and a grossly positive OA is not an exception to the rule. This is the rule. We most often see much more intense findings on OA than we see on Doppler. And there are several reasons for this in terms of physics. First of all, Doppler's angle independent. It shows things best at zero degrees. And if the angle of incidence is near 90 degrees, Doppler often cannot show anything at all. Um, Doppler does not uh, 
uh, show flow if the, if the flow is too slow. So in a Venus lake and a placenta, we can see flow on grayscale ultrasound, but Doppler can't show a signal because it's too slow. No velocity at all is required to show an OA signal. Um, and OA is not angle dependent. The biggest difference, I think, is the contrast ratio. Uh, Doppler has a very poor contrast ratio, less than two to one. And what that means is it doesn't tolerate volume averaging. So in order to see a vessel on Doppler, it pretty much has to fill a whole voxel. And so if you're looking at uh, voxels that are say 500 microns in the axoplane and 1000 microns in the horizontal planes, you know, a vessel is gonna have to be somewhere between 500 microns and 1000 microns, almost a millimeter in size to be visible on Doppler. On the other hand, the contrast ratio on OA is anywhere from six to 20 to one. And that means it can tolerate a tremendous amount of, of volume averaging. So what that means is that a vessel might fill only 10% of a voxel um, on OA, uh, but if the contrast ratio is 20 to one, that voxel will still light up with a two to one contrast ratio. The vessel will look bigger than its true size, but it'll still be visible on OA. And the final thing is we can see a uh, relative degree of oxygenation on OA, which Doppler cannot show. So these are major differences between uh, Doppler and OA. This is a triple negative cancer that looks benign on ultrasound and has a false negative Doppler. But you can see it's got intense um, deoxygenation and polymorphic vessels. So there's a concordancy of the suspicious morphology and suspicious function on OA. And I'll show you the data on this later, but many times um, mucinous carcinomas in, in encapsulated papillary and triple negatives show this appearance. This was a triple negative cancer showing the advantage of OA over Doppler. There's a lot of data on uh, elastography as well. This is shear wave elastography and a very good shear wave elastography. In general, uh, green and blue are considered negative. So this is a false negative shear wave elastogram, but you can see how intensely positive the OA is um, com compared to elastography. Now, elastography can be very good for lesions over a centimeter. But many screen detected lesions, especially if they're supplemental ultrasound or MR screening, are under 10 millimeters. And uh, elastography can lose uh, 10 or 20% uh, sensitivity in those small lesions, whereas we only lose about 1% uh, of sensitivity on OA. So uh, for small screen detected lesions under 10 millimeters, tremendous advantage for elastography. So if we think about all the advantages of combined uh, OA and ultrasound, uh, we can more reliably distinguish benign from malignant. Uh, so we've got a better diagnostic confidence. There's no patient discomfort. There's no IV contrast to radionuclides, no ionized radiation. We've got the, essentially the spatial resolution of ultrasound, which is very good. Um, and it's pretty easy for imagers to make the uh, translation. If they, if they do any handheld ultrasound on their own, because it's very much like using an ultrasound probe. This is the machine. Um, it has a combination of laser and ultrasound equipment in there, but it's about the same size uh, as, a, as a premium ultrasound machine. This is the face of the OA duplex probe, the ultrasound transducer is in the center. It's an 18 megahertz transducer. These are quartz laser windows out of either side. We sent both wavelengths out of both sides. This is the side view of the duplex probe. The thicker cord contains a combination of laser fiber optics and, and the electronics for the ultrasound probe. And importantly, we have a standard ultrasound probe as well as the duplex probe for a couple of reasons. First of all, ergonomically, uh, this uh, stiff, stiffer, thicker cord um, could be more fatiguing during the day. But more importantly, um, the approval for OA is for better characterization or better classification of solid or complex cystic and solid masses between virus three and five. And the truth of the matter is, depending on your case mix, somewhere between 70 and 90% of all your ultrasounds are gonna be virus one and two. And in those cases, there isn't much point doing OA. So what you, you don't wanna have two machines in a room. You don't wanna have your regular ultrasound machine, premium ultrasound machine uh, and an OA machine. We want to be able to do everything on the same machine. So this is a great probe for uh, going through and deciding whether you have a BioReds 1 or 2 or BioReds 3 or higher mass. And then when you have BioReds 3 or higher mass, that's when you turn on the OA. This is also a great probe for guiding interventional procedures. Both probes can do color Doppler, power Doppler, shear wave elastography in duplex mode. We do plan on having a triplex mode where we can do ultrasound OA and elastography or ultrasound OA and Doppler, but that hasn't yet been developed.
this is a, a larger view uh, of the probe. The 18 megahertz transducer in the center uh, has a very wide bandwidth because the frequencies at which we detect uh, the OA signal are, are quite low. So it goes all the way from main one megahertz to 18 megahertz. The uh, standalone ultrasound probe is five megahertz to 18 megahertz. It's uh, 50 millimeters wide. And uh, we can fire anywhere from 35 to 55 frames a second on ultrasound, but we can only fire uh, 10 um, uh, signals uh, per second of OA. And it takes both a long and a short wave to create a frame. So that means that the color uh, frames are updated five frames per second. So there is a difference in the frame rate between the OA and the ultrasound. And that requires a slow, steady, you know, when we're doing these video sweeps, it has to be slow and steady because if you move too fast, you can create spatial and temporal misregistration. We created a scoring system for the OE features first, and physicians were so good at this that every single one of these features distinguished benign from ligand with a p-value of less than uh, 0 0.0001. And so, um, we learned when we did our false negative analysis that most of the misses came not because the OA wasn't right, but because the ultrasound was underclassified. So we decided since the OA features were working so well, we should create ultrasound features parallel to that. And they're, they're largely based on BIRADs, but they're arranged ordinally. So as the scores go up, the PPV goes up. Uh, and, and we have some very low PPVs and some very high PPVs, which differs a bit from BIRADs where many of the PPVs are sort of in the middle of the range. The other thing we learned is that these external features, because BIRADS has emphasized the hypovolt central nidus so much, radiologists were having a difficult time seeing the boundary zone and the peripheral zone features. And so we actually did a study where we had two radiologists read 100 cases, reading in their usual inside out fashion, score the internal zone, then score the boundary zone, and then the peripheral zone, and then wait 30 days and shuffle the order and have them rescore these cases using the opposite approach, scoring the peripheral zone first, then the boundary zone, then the internal zone. And they scored much better on both ultrasound and OA. And, and so it was necessary to train people to read in a fashion that overcomes the internal zone bias uh, it, that uh, exists in, in BIRADS. So again, we use three zones. The internal zone corresponds to the hypoclexeldronitis, which in addition five of BIRADS is considered the whole mass. I, I saw a preview of uh, BIRADS edition six, and they're now recommending that the echogenic rind on invasive malignancies be included in the measurement. So it's, it's gonna be changed uh, for the better in, in edition six. The boundary zone again corresponds to the thick echogenic rim, or again in, in edition, six uh, rind, thick echogenic rind, or the thin echogenic capsule and the purple zone is outside of that. And we read in an outside in fashion. So we score these purple radiating vessels first, then the boundary zone vessels, and then the internal. And that way, um, people can't ignore the external blindness. What we found allowing the inside out pattern is people stayed in their comfort zone and they scored the lesion or they classified the lesion based almost entirely upon the internal findings and pretty much ignored the boundaries on the peripheral findings. But if we forced that outside in pattern, they couldn't ignore the peripheral findings. <clears throat> it's important to know that all cancers don't look alike on um, OA. And in fact, so the left upper corner, these are all small sub-millimeter, sub-centimeter cancers. The upper left is a triple negative, and you can see it's intensely deoxygenated in the internal and the boundary zone, but it's negative in the peripheral zone. It doesn't have peripheral radiating vessels, which come in and out on spicules or retracted Cooper's ligaments. On the upper right is a uh, luminal A, and it's completely negative internally, but the boundary zone is positive and the peripheral zone is positive. And the bottom is a, uh, a grade two luminal B cancer with a high KI67 that's positive in all three zones. So we originally taught people these findings just because we knew that grade three would look different from grade two from, from grade one. But we now realize this is actually an advantage because there are four types of imaging biomarkers, qualitative diagnostic, uh, predictive, um, prognostic, and monitoring. And we're actually looking um, at uh, OE features as being prognostic. So triple negatives are positive in two of the three zones, the internal boundary zone, um, luminal A's are, and grade ones are, are positive in two of the three, but it, it's, it's the internal zone that's negative, the boundary zone, peripheral zone are positive. 
and the liminal Bs tend to be positive in all three zones. Now, what we realized is that um, it's a lot of information. You can see that we had 14 scores, five ultrasound scores, five OA scores, mammographic biorads, age, size, and, and depth of posterior margin of mass. And it, it almost became information overload for the physician. So they were scoring features very well, but they were having some difficulty converting into likelihood of malignancy. So it's a two-step process. Identify and score the features. They did very well at that. Convert those features to likelihood of malignancy almost information overload. And what we realized is that AI machine learning decision support tool helped them deal with this great uh, number of uh, um, features. Also, uh, the human mind doesn't like discordances and discordances are actually common. I just showed you how triple negatives are only positive in two of the three zones. So they have a mixture of high and low scores, same with luminal A um, and the same with ultrasound features. And so basically, the human mind wants cancer to have all high scores and benign to have all lowest possible scores. And when there's a mixture of high and low scores, the human mind has difficulty with that. And the, the AI machine learning decision support is not troubled by that at all. So that's a great advantage. Um, also, the decision support tool allows us to use a combination of false negative rate and uh, POM or likelihood of malignancy, uh, whereas Vireds uses only PPV or likelihood of malignancy. Now, we have we've heard that radiology, which is always one of the top three residencies for recruiting, is having more difficulty recruiting because um, medical students are worried about being replaced by AI. But that's AI deep learning and primarily for screening. This AI decision support tool is not going to replace you. It's just going to help you make better decision. Uh, we've created a very nice graphic interface for looking at these things. Um, and so you can just go score these features by clicking on a radio button. And after a lot of experience, um, you know, I tended to do that because I had memorized all the scores. But we have image reference keys. So you can hit this little reference key button. Image reference keys will come up. So here's shape ones, flat oval, plump oval, round, irregular uh, without angles, wider than tall, uh, irregular without angles, taller than wide, and then irregular with angles. And so you can just click on the um, image that looks most like what you're seeing, it'll automatically populate, then you can hit the next feature and go on and you go through all the OA features the same way. Notice that the frames around these are color coded uh, for the PPV of that finding as an individual finding as a univariate uh, factor. But remember that the AI decision support tool is multifactorial. So, um, you know, when you average uh, one finding or one feature with 13 other features, uh, the PPV curve is going to get flatter. This is the output. The blue circle is the mean likelihood of malignancy with a 90% confidence interval from the fifth to the 95th percentile. This would be a very high 4C, about 90%. And this is a very low uh, uh, false negative rate. So the left of this line is predicted false negative rate to the right is predicted likelihood of malignancy. And we can see that the mean and the entire 90% confidence interval is below a half percent there. So this would be a BIRADS 5 output. This would be you know, very low 4B, just maybe 11%. And this would be very low, uh, perhaps low enough to call BIREDS 2. Uh, but we don't have enough time to go into that now. Now, when you predict a likelihood of malignancy or false negative rate, you know, what you predict has to be true. So this, these flesh colored dots are a plot of predicted likelihood of malignancy or false negative rate versus actual. And you can see there's a very nice straight linear plot and it's extremely tight down at the low end. So our false negative rates are, are smack on. And, and so if we predict a low uh, false negative rate of less than a half percent in 703 cases in which that happened, 700 were benign. So that was the 99.6% correct. Um, and that has some implications about whether you might be able in the future to classify a BIREDS three probable fiber adenomas by reds two on a baseline without having to wait two years of, of stability on follow-ups. So um, this dotted line is the 2% line of false negative rate. Uh, anything to the left of that is gonna be by reds three or two. Anything to the right of that is four or higher. Basically what we get from by reds edition five was this blue line and anything to the right or to the right, we guess, and we don't even attempt to guess to the left, but we have a precise and objective way of predicting false negative rate um, and uh, likelihood of malignancy with the AI decision support tool. And that's important because, um, you know, it, it sort of brings 
a way to a, a combined qualitative diagnostic predictive biomarker. The gray dots are the distribution of features. And so what we're seeing is that we're getting a shift of lesions into the virids two and three and up into 4C and five. And in general, we expect the malignant ones to go up from 4A to 4B to 4C or five, and the benign ones to go from 4A and 4B down to two and three. Uh, but to do that, you'll have to look at individual categories. So how did, how did it actually work when we downclassified BIREDS uh, um, 4A to BIREDS 3? Well, the false negative rate was only 0.2%. And if we used the combination of 4A in the lower half of 4B on ultrasound and, and downclassified to BIREDS 3, it was still only 1% false negative rate. So if the goal was less than 2%, that was achieved. Now, I mentioned that in BIREDS, we just sort of guesstimate the likelihood of malignancy. And obviously, uh, high volume dedicated breast imagers generally guess better than body breast hybrids that do lower volumes that only cover the breast center every Friday, say. Um, but even dedicated breast imagers have trouble hitting the benchmark. So this green shaded area is the ACR PPV benchmark range for each BIREDS category. And what you'd like to be is in the center of the green all the way. And you can see with Opsan only using a subjective assignment of likelihood of malignancy, we're too high at 4A and we're too high at 4B. And that's important because if you try to downgrade, you know, post-test probability depends on pre-test probability. And your ultrasound assignment of likelihood of malignancy is totally subjective. And, and there's actually a higher chance than you think you're going to have a higher than, uh, than acceptable false negative rate. Red shows what we get with the OA um, AI decision support tool. And you can see it puts us right in the middle. So it's giving us a more objective and precise way to assign BIREDS categories. So again, when we look at workflow, you don't want two machines in the room. You want one machine that can do everything you do. It's got to have a very high quality ultrasound image. The, the machine we have is a, a premium uh, machine with a standalone ultrasound probe that goes from five to 18 megahertz and has all the modalities, color and power dots, and we're sure wave elastography and can guide all the biopsies and interventions that you want to do. And when you get virus three to five, that's when you turn on OA. So it, it's very efficient. And this is the output we get. The patient benefits are that um, you know there's no ionizing radiation and no need for injected contrast agents or radionuclide, and it's real time, so you can get an answer very quickly, many times uh, just with a single sweep across the lesion, and it's going to prevent um, or minimize the false positives and, and biopsies uh, that yield benign histology, so it should be able to reduce overall costs. So it's important that you have training. So we offer a didactic training uh, and it's, and, and the training includes not just the OE feature scoring, but also the ultrasound feature scoring because it differs a little bit from, from BIREDS. Uh, we have interactive uh, cases, uh, proficiency test cases and on-site user training. And uh, I, again, you know, you just have one machine in the room. This, this uh, OA machine can do whatever you do and you're the current ultrasound machine. Um, as well as OA. Now, one of the things we always worry about with a new modality is that only the experienced uh, radiologist, uh, the dedicated breast imagers that are high volume, um, can do well. This is a scatter graph of specificity at exactly 98% sensitivity for ultrasound on the left in blue and for OA on the right uh, in red, uh, with years of experience on the bottom. And we intentionally included body breast hybrids with just a few years and dedicated breast imagers with a lot of years experience. And you can see there's no, there's no trend here. Um, the younger, less experienced, lower volume radiologists did as well as the more experienced. So that's, that's encouraging. For ordinal scores, uh, the distribution is not normal. Uh, and so um, Cohen's kappa is not the right parameter for assessing ordinal scoring systems. Um, and, and so um, interclass correlation is a better way to do it. But we can see that for all masses and for subsets of benign and, and cancer mass, malignant masses, um, the interclass correlation was higher for OA with ultrasound than it was for mammography or ultrasound alone, which, you know, it's pretty surprising since uh, most of these um, readers had much, much more experience in mammography and ultrasound. And that's also encouraging that they were able to pick it up so quickly. Um, we ran a model um, showing how many uh, diagnostic procedures could be um, decreased and, and how many 
biopsies uh, that yield benign histology could be decreased. And it looked like a potential of $4 billion savings. That was on the old data from Pioneer study. The, the newer data from the Reader 2 study will be better, but hasn't been done yet. The important thing is that many patients don't get a single diagnostic test. And we found that about half of the patients had uh, at least two diagnostic tests, and another 20 or 30% had three, and another 10% had four. And, and so OA can prevent those second and third and fourth diagnostic tests, and that's how it's getting savings on diagnosis. Uh, we've got extensive literature on OA in major journals, AGR, European Radiology, uh, Radiology. And I'm just going to show you some cases now of up classification and down classification. So this is a 50-year-old female with a palpable lump, pretty big, 4.8 centimeter maximum diameter. Depth of the posterior wall was uh, 2.9 centimeters. And the Byrads classification from the mammogram was 4A um, and, and from ultrasound was 4A. Now notice there's a clip in there. So apparently this had been previously biopsied, so it must have been growing. I mean, it must have been biopsied previously and shown to be a fibroadenoma, but it was growing, so they were worried that maybe it was a phyllodes tumor. Here's the ultrasound and OA and the uh, Doppler. It's a bit irregular, uh, and it's the, the lobules are somewhat uh, smaller than I would say macrolobulated, so um, that would be classified as 4A. You can see there's very low scores except for shape and echo texture, which is heterogeneous. But the OA is very reassuring. It's got small monomorphic vessels, mostly green, draping capsular vessels. So the morphology and the function are very reassuring. All those scores, the scoring, remember, goes from 0 to 5 or 0 to 6. And when we plot this out, uh, you can see that the mean predicted likelihood of malignancy is about 0.4%. Um, and the 95th percentile is right at about 0.5%. And again, what, what our study showed was that if, uh, if, if, the, if the mean likelihood of malignancy was less than half percent in 703 cases, in 702, it was actually benign. And, and the, for predicted mean false negative rate less than half percent, the actual, fall, predicted fall, uh, the actual false negative rate was 0 0.4. So it was accurately predicting a very low incidence. Why am I saying 0.5? Because the truth of the matter is in the literature, uh, there's no um, articles in which the false negative rate in by rates to zero percent. For ultrasound, it's between 0.3 and 0.5 percent. So if you can achieve an actual false negative rate less than half percent, you could consider the possibility of a by rates two on a baseline. Now, if we look about down classifying uh, 4A and 4B to by rates three or two, we can see that we had a gross downgrade to three and two of 50 percent, but we had a few false positive upgrades. So the net downgrade uh, 4As on ultrasound in red to uh, less than 4A on, uh, on OA with the decision support tool was 21.6%, even better for the lower half of 4B. Now, why do we even attempt to do 4B? Well, I mean, to date, people have only attempted to down classify Byrads 4A to 3. But the negative likelihood of OA of 0 0.047 uh, if you plug it into Bayes' theorem, it says that theoretically you should be able to downgrade everything from 30% uh, to 2% with a negative OA. And uh, the, the Byred's PPV range for um, 4B is, is 10, greater than 10 to less than or equal to 50. So 30% is the lower half of 4B. So, you know, the net negative likelihood ratio in Bayes' theorem predicts that you should be able to downgrade the lower half of 4B. And indeed, we had 49.9% gross downgrades of, of low 4Bs to uh, 3 and 2, and 48.4% uh, uh, net. There's another case, 24-year-old female with a palpable lump, 1.8 centimeter diameter, a 1.9 centimeter depth of posterior wall, no mammogram because she's too young. It's a classic Byrads 3 on ultrasound, very low scores, a normal purple zone, uh, flat oval shape, uh, or uh, complete thin capsule plump oval shape, uh, mildly hypocoic texture, uh, and uh, normal sound transmission. This is a video sweep across it. And we store video sweeps on both ultrasound and OE. We found that the, the video sweeps help score the ultrasound as well. Uh, Doppler is true negative. And we can see that on OA, we have a draping capsular vein on the front. It's red, but the morphology is normal. All the vessels in size 
our, uh, you know, mixture of red and green, which is normal. Again, every living tissue has to have arteries and veins, but they're monomorphic. At any given depth, you can see these vessels are similar in size, shape, and orientation because they have an orderly branch pattern. The scores are all very low. And again, this one predicts a likelihood of malignancy less than half percent. And this was a benign fibroid adenoma. Now, how often do we down classify BIREDS 3 to 2? Well, you can see that 34% of the ultrasound BIREDS 3s, which is red, were down classified to uh, BIREDS 2. But we had some false positive upgrades to 4A, so the net downgrade was 20.6%. So one out of every five cases that's currently BIREDS 3 on ultrasound potentially might have a low enough uh, false negative rate to be considered by REDS2. Now, am I recommending people do this? No, it's not the standard of care, but the results are interesting enough that it would be very interesting for people to, to, to see if they could do this in their own uh, department. Uh, we also can upclassify some lesions. This is a 70-year-old uh, female that had a mammographic uh, circumscribed mass, was considered by REDS 4A, not because it looks suspicious, just because of her age. Uh, and it had maximum diameter of 1.2 centimeters and a depth of posterior mass of 1.9 centimeters. You can see it's plump oval in shape with enhanced true transmission, well circumscribed with a thin capsule, heterogeneous texture. So it, it gives us pretty low scores, except for the heterogeneous internal texture. Uh, but you can see that it's intensely positive on OA. So it generates, uh, you know, normal peripheral zone scores or, or reassuring peripheral zone scores, but the boundary zone is high. And the three internal scores are as high. And I, I mentioned to you that that's typical of triple negatives. So when you plug all those scores in, it takes it from um, a BIREDS 3 on ultrasound to BIREDS 40 with about a 7% likelihood of malignancy. And the 95th percentile is actually in the low 4B category. And this was, as expected, a grade 3 triple negative with KI uh, 67 of, of um, uh, 50%. So how often do we upclassify BIREDS 3 to 4A? Well, you have to realize that radiologists are very good at ultrasound and, and avoiding the false negatives. So the false negative ultrasounds were less than 2%, as you would expect. But of those cases that were false negative, more than 40% were upgraded to true positive on OA. So even though it doesn't happen very often, uh, the OA can certainly help prevent ultrasound false negatives on triple negatives, mucinous cancers, and encapsulated papillary carcinomas. This is another case of an upgrade, 77-year-old, not palpable uh, mammographic mass, 0.7 centimeters. It's a little indistinct, but maybe if I had spot compression uh, mammograms on, on this patient, I could call it 4C, but uh, because it was so small, we called it 4B. The ultrasound is a little more worrisome, probably 4C. Got a thick echogenic rind, a little weak shadowing, taller than wide, interrupted tissue planes, spicules in the boundary zone and peripheral zone. So high scores on OPSIM, uh, but also very high scores on OA. Um, so you can see that it's tremendous deoxygenation internally in the boundary zone. And it's got some peripheral radiating vessels, which you can see over best on the OA total view. So it's, it's positive in all three zones suggesting that it should be a great uh, grade two or three uh, luminal B cancer. And this comes out, you know, very high uh, by REDS-5. The important thing here is that it was called 4B on the mammogram. And, uh, you know, 4A and 4B lead to most of the false positives and negative biopsies and additional diagnostic imaging tests. And so we found that uh, 50 percent, 53 percent of all the false negatives or false positives, I'm sorry, arose in BIRETS 4A, and another 30 percent arose in, in 4B. So 83 percent of all the false positives and negative biopsies arose in the 4A and 4B categories. So if you can take a 4A and 4B and upgrade it to 4C or 5, you get rid of a lot of additional diagnostic imaging tests. And how often does that happen? Well, we can see that for combined 4A and 4B on ultrasound in red, um, 35.6 percent of the time, OA upgraded to 4C or 5, and there were some false negative downgrades, uh, but you know that was just in this subgroup. Overall, the false negatives were less than 2 percent, and um, you know 31.3 percent were net upgrades. Now, one interesting histologic correlation. One thing about um, OA is that in the Maestro study in the Netherlands, we um, twisted the pathologist arms into giving us five by mega, uh, seven megacassettes 
rather than the small one by one the slides that they normally use because we recognize that most of the features we're seeing were in the boundary zone and purple zone and on those small slides we might never get a look at the boundary and purple zone so we limited the maximum diameter of three centimeters and we had a five by seven centimeter cassette which meant that we always had at least a centimeter of uh, surrounding tissue uh, and so we have lots of correlations on benign cancers but this is a very interesting one uh, people argue about whether floaties tumors formed in ovo or from pre-existing um, fibroadenomas and this one strongly suggests that maybe they arise from uh, pre-existing fibroadenoma so the pink part is fibroadenoma uh, the purple part of this lesion is uh, floaties tumor and you can see that this is the pink part on ultrasound and the floaties part on OA. you can see it's a lot more vascular uh, so if i magnify and show the division line uh, you can see that there are many more purple structures here, which are stromal cells. And you can see that the vessels are much larger and more numerous on the uh, side of the floaties. And sure enough, uh, you know, you can actually see that borderline between floaties and the fibroadenoma part on the way. So a very interesting case. So in summary, optoacoustics is a fusion imaging technique, more analogous to PET-CT or PET-MR than uh, uh, ultrasound submodality such as Doppler or, or uh, elastography. It's a fusion of two modalities, laser photonics and ultrasound imaging, but it's also a fusion of functional morphologic imaging. Um, the functional and morphologic imaging are complementary and, and offer the potential of reducing false positives and biops biopsies of benign entities by improving the specificity without sacrificing sensitivity. And what we found using morphology alone, the grayscale ultrasound morphology alone, is that Every time we try to push our specificity up, we adversely affect sensitivity. We don't want to do that. We want to improve specificity without sacrificing sensitivity. And this fusion technology allows that. The strengths of OA and ultrasound complement each other, and the weaknesses of OA and ultrasound complement each other. So it's, it's a one plus one is three situation. And uh, the artificial intelligence machine learning decision support tool helps the radiologist incorporate all of this data and deal with uh, discordances and uh, and, um, and, and also allows a combination of false negative rate and PPV, which we don't get in, in BIREDS. And it makes sense that we don't do it in BIREDS because BIREDS was developed mostly for mammographic screening. And in screening, you can never truly know your sensitivity. And the equation for false negative rate is one minus sensitivity. So if you don't know sensitivity, you don't know the false negative rate. Um, and, and so um, we get some benefit by using AI decision support to you tool to use a combination of false negative rate at and below 2% and, uh, and then PPV above. The equations are obviously different. And so you need some sort of mapping device to map PPV or likelihood of malignancy onto false negative rate at and below 2%. But the machine learning has no problems with that. Thank you very much. Uh, for more information, uh, we have these codes you can look at. And we'll now take questions. Thank you very much. We'll now take questions. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, I'm Tom Stavros. My apologies, Dr. Stavros. Are you able to hear me? My apartment is right under the uh, the runway to the domestic airport here, so it's very easy. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we have a couple of questions. Let me go ahead. Attendees have submitted during the presentation that we watched. Uh, first question that I would like to ask is, do you see OAUS being used as a specialty referral at specialty referral centers or adopted by mainstream centers? I believe that it's a, you know, if you look at the S-shaped development curve, there are early adopters and then, the, you know, that's the flat lower part of the S. And then uh, there's the steep part where the mainstream adopts it. And then there's the upper flat part of the S that's mostly a replacement market. So I think it'll be a, a two-stage process. I think initially uh, the high volume tertiary referral dedicated breast imagers will, will be the first to adopt it. 
and after a period of time, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully if I do my job, that flat part of the S will be shorter and we'll hit the steep part where it's adopted in lower volume, less specialized uh, body breast hybrids um, in as short a time as possible. But I think it'll be a two-stage process and it's up, to, it's up to us and me, our sales and marketing department, me and education and, and writing and actually some of our early adopters writing papers and things in order to shorten the period of time before uh, before we get to the steep part of the S curve. Wonderful. And I have a question from an attendee that has come in, but before I get to it, I do always like to take the opportunity to remind all attendees, um, submit your questions now. The doctor is going to be online until we hit our 60 minute mark at 3 Eastern. You can use that question feature on your webinar dashboard. Uh, but Dr. Stavros, this attendee would like to know what impact the level of skin pigmentation have on the accuracy of hemoglobin measures? Consider a recent article questioning pulse oximetry in non-white patients. This is one of the huge advantages of optoacoustics over diffuse optic tomography. Uh, we have the spatial resolution of ultrasound, which is millimeter or submillimeter. A diffuse optic tomography has a hard time telling what's boundary zone from internal. Uh, clearly, all of our data show the boundary zone is the most important. The majority of the angiogenesis is in the boundary zone. When you compare the boundary zone on OA and ultrasound to internal scores or peripheral zone scores, the boundary zone is the most important. So drawing that region of interest between the internal and the boundary zone correctly is important. If you mistakenly just sloppily draw a circle on there and you include a lot of the boundary zone in what you're calling internal zone, the AI decision support tool could relatively underweight uh, the feature scoring. Uh, internal, internal scores are weighted less than boundary zone scores. So the, it is important to precisely draw that. It's right now it's manual. And you know, clearly that takes some time, especially if you're going through a video loop with 90 frames. Um, you don't want to draw a region of interest on six different frames. You want to kind of quickly, I just grab the little bar and survey it back and forth, try to quickly find the best frame so I can draw the fewest number if possible. But um, clearly we recognize that uh, this can be automated. So probably the first thing we're going to do with deep learning the decision support tools, machine learning, but the other part of AI is deep learning. The first thing we're going to do is, is auto segment the lesion so that you won't have to do it. And we'll likely give you a choice of four different ROIs. You can choose the one that's the closest to what you think you would have manually drawn. And then there'll be little easier points where you can tweak and adjust it if you want to. But uh, the, the boundary zone between, or the region of interest that we draw between the boundary zone and peripheral zone, not so important because they're approximately equally weighted in the, in the, in the decision support tool. But um, that inner white region of interest between the internal and the boundary zone is, is very important to get accurate. Next question that we have is, what protective gear, if any, is required with the OAUS laser? Everybody must wear protective eyewear, uh, and it can't just be any sunglasses. It has to be glasses that have lenses that block the specific uh, wavelengths of the laser lights we use. Uh, since the patient is on her back and laser could theoretically come up under the glasses, we use a ski goggle type um, protective eyewear for the patient. Um, it's more like, they look more like sunglasses. Uh, for uh, the radiologist or the sonographer. We also have a lock on the room uh, that's activated. It, you know, that's part of the safety procedure that, you know, people can't be walking into the room while you're scanning because if they don't know you're scanning, they could walk in without protective eyewear. So there's an interlock uh, to the laser pedal, uh, an electronic lock for the door so people can't walk in the room accidentally. And obviously you don't want, you know, you don't want a, a room with windows, but Generally, we don't do that with ultrasound anyway because it's too much light in the room. 
couple of addition, additional questions we're going to see if we can get through. Uh, are optoacoustics the same as photoacoustics? Yes. Wonderful. The, uh, the person who invented optoacoustics called it optoacoustics, and that's why we call it optoacoustics. Uh, later, later researchers have termed it photoacoustics, but when you're searching the literature, you want to search photoacoustics and optoacoustics because they're the same. Fair enough. And it looks like we have time for one last question before we hit our 60-minute mark. How quickly are results made available from the point of scanning to when they appear on the radiologist console for scoring or interpretation? Well, the scan takes, let's say, 15 minutes. Uh, it can be 10 minutes in some cases. Um, then looking at the videos and scoring it, is a, a learning thing. Uh, when you're first starting, you probably make too long of video loops, uh, maybe goof up a couple of video loops. You might be looking at four video loops. You might have 180 frames in one loop, and 120 in another. But after you get used to it, you usually have just two loops of 90. And I don't wait for the loops to play. I just go back and forth through them, and I, I can score it rather quickly. Uh, so looking at it and scoring it is, is you know, generally about a five minute process. So I'd say 15 minutes to scan and five minutes to read. But Dr. Stavros, there's no post-processing required. It's all real time, no, correct? No, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all real time and it's stored as video loops and still images on the machine. Um, and uh, there is a, a AIDST uh, support tool built into the machine most people would prefer not to tie their machine up because, you know, if, you, if you're going to do 20 cases a day in a room, you don't want to be messing around entering your scores on the machine. You'd prefer to have a workstation offline where you do that. You know, Dr. Stavros, one additional question came in that I'd love to touch on before we wrap up. Uh, where is this used so far outside of the U.S.? Are there any hospitals in Europe? Uh, we've used it in, uh, we're using it right now in three um, hospitals in the Netherlands as part of a registry study, and there were two additional ones as part of the Maestro study. So we had five sites in the, in the Netherlands, and we've had a total of uh, 16 sites in the U.S. for the Pioneer trial, and then an, an additional site for the Generation 2 study, an additional site for a new adjuvant study. So we've had 18 in the United States and uh, five in the Netherlands. Wonderful. Dr. Stavros, I can't thank you enough for your time today. This was a great presentation and very informative. I'm sure the ICE community enjoyed it. I, I'd like to encourage everyone that participated to visit our sponsor's website. You can learn more about CNO Medical by visiting cnomedical.com. Uh, there was the URL that was distributed in the chat today. But as a point of reference, that is senomedical.com. A quick reminder to the attendees that you can obtain your CE certificate by completing the post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed within one hour after today's webinar. Uh, you must complete the survey to obtain the CE certificate, and you'll be able to download it directly from your computer once that survey is submitted. As always, if you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Stay in touch with the ICE webinar series. We have additional webinars coming up throughout 2022. You can find them listed online at icewebinars.live. All right, guys, make it a great rest of your week. We'll see you back soon with ICE webinars. Thank you, everybody.